All right, so about a year ago, I saw for the first time this poster on a subway, and it was of a child submerged in this black water, face up with just his mouth barely breaking the surface. And the caption said, cystic fibrosis is like drowning on the inside. And about a year ago, I saw this poster, and I said to myself, well, that sounds like a terrible thing. And about a year ago, I went on my way. But I think it's funny just how much can change in one year. Today I want to talk to you about a year. A year that began the summer after 10th grade. The first month of that year, July, was spent as a summer program on Canada's eastern shores with 50 other of Canada's top high school students. There, I met a student named Adarsh, and it was maybe the second or third day, I was just getting to know him, and I asked him, so Adarsh, what do you do outside of school? And he said, well, Marshall, I do research into the applications of nanocellulose substrates for the production of organic lead-emitting diodes for medical instruments requiring optical precision. <laughs> and as you can imagine, the conversation ended right there. <laughs> but as the month went on, I got to know Adarsh a bit better. I got to know that he, like me, had just finished the 10th grade, that he was working in a university lab, looking at different ways to combine different types of plant fibers, different types of cellulose, to create a more effective, efficient, and sustainable light-emitting diode. Now, this was an entirely new concept to me, that a high school student could work in a university lab doing research alongside master's students and PhD students on the very forefront of current scientific knowledge. I was amazed. And, you know, I always liked science as a kid. When I was like four or five, I wanted to be an astronaut. Um, but learning science in school really just was never that exciting to me. Like, memorizing these facts, spitting out formulas, it just never really clicked. And so when I got home the second month of that year, in August, I had one goal in mind for the rest of the summer. Like a darsh, I wanted a taste of real science. And so for that entire month of August, I emailed professors from the University of Toronto, from York University, from Ryerson University, asking if I could be part of their lab for the rest of the summer and the school year. Every day in August, I would try and send out at least three emails, look over th their lab pages, find out what these professors were doing, and send them emails. And every single day, I would check my inbox. And on, a good, or on an average day, maybe nobody would reply. And on a good day, on a good day, maybe one professor, one person, would be kind enough to at least respond with a no. And so it went like that for the rest of the month. By the end of August, there were two professors left on my contact list. The first of the two asked if I wanted to come in for an interview in his office downtown. And so a few days later, I spent a whole morning navigating my way downtown on public transit, and I showed up in his office, and I stepped in. And the very first question he asked me was, so Marshall, you're a university student, right? Sir? A university student? I thought I mentioned my email. I'm just a high school student. I'm about to start grade 11. But that was it. I was a high school student. He couldn't do it. And so at the beginning of September, the third month of that year, there was one professor left on my list. Dr. Christine Baer of the University of Toronto and the co-chair of the Cystic Fibrosis Research Center at the Hospital for Sick Children. She replied to my email saying that she would call me the next day at around noon to discuss research ideas. And I thought this was my big break. The next day at around noon, I put, sat down on my table, put my phone on my desk, and just stared at it. And 12 o'clock came, 12.01 came, 12.02 came, 12.05, 12.15, 12.45, no call. And so that night I emailed Dr. Bear. I said, Dr. Bear, I didn't get a call from you. And she said, oh, Marshall, I must have forgotten. I'll call you again tomorrow, I promise. And so the next day, at around 11.50, I sat down on my table, put my phone on my desk, and stared at it. And again, 12 o'clock, 12.01, 12.02, 12.15, 12.45, no call. And that night, again, I emailed Dr. Bear. I said, Dr. Bear, I didn't get a call from you. And she said, oh, Marshall, I had a meeting. I'll call you again tomorrow. And for the third day in a row, I sat down on my desk, my phone on my table, and watched 12 o'clock come, and I watched 12 o'clock go with no call. And that night, I emailed Dr. Bear. I said, Dr. Bear, I don't think this whole phone conversation thing is working out. I think <laughs> we should meet face to face. And she agreed. And so three or four days before school started, we set up that meeting date. On the morning of the meeting date, I woke up at around... 9 a.m., I checked my email, and at 6 a.m., Dr. Bear had sent me an email. She said that she had asked different professors, different uh, researchers all across the university, all across the lab and the hospital, and they just couldn't seem to find a spot in the lab for a high school student. And she said she didn't think today the meeting would be necessary. The meeting wouldn't be necessary? I just looked for a whole month. This was my last professor. There was a few days left until school. I couldn't just give it up now. And so four hours later, I showed up at her door anyway. I knocked on her office, and she came out, and she looked pretty surprised, and she said, Marshall, did you get my email from this morning? Yeah, absolutely not. What email? And she sighed, 
And since I was already there, she offered me a tour of the lab. And by the end of the day, she said, look, Marshall, we'll keep trying to make things work. And work they did. For the next seven months, from September to March, I worked on cystic fibrosis, the most common fatal genetic disease among Caucasians, a disease where your lungs fill up with a thick, sticky mucus that prevents you from breathing and provides an incredible breeding ground for deadly bacterial infections a disease for which almost all current treatment is limited to clinical care, care that only addresses the symptoms of the disease, like mucus thinning agents or antibiotics, instead of the fundamental molecular cause. For those seven months, I worked on Canada's most powerful supercomputing cluster, Cyanet, looking at the, the interactions of small drug-like molecules with the protein that, when mutated, causes cystic fibrosis. And let me tell you, it wasn't all fun and games. I had never programmed anything in my life before. And so when I logged onto that supercomputer for the first time, and I just saw like, it was literally like the matrix on my computer screen, I was horrified and scared, and I didn't really know what to do. But after seven months of bumbling around here and stumbling around there and a whole lot of Googling, I managed to get some pretty interesting results by March. My computational simulation suggested that if two particular small molecules were used in combination, they would be able to produce a synergistic effect in the rescue of the basic defect that causes cystic fibrosis. But all of this computational data, it's interesting, but it doesn't really hold a lot of weight unless there's some experimental verification. And I had signed up for a few science fairs in May, and all I had at this point in March was just some simulations. And so I needed some kind of experimental verification. But there was no time to get it. The only chance I had was during March break, five days, just enough time for a single experiment. And so on the Monday I went in, I met my, uh, the PhD student that would be supervising me, Steve Malinsky, who's in the audience today. And we proceeded to set up our experiment, a single experiment testing whether or not these two compounds could work together. The days passed, and by Friday at around 3 or 4 p.m., we got the results. And when I looked at the results, I saw that not only were the two compounds working together, they were working together so well that they almost doubled the effect of the most potent corrector compound known to date. And so with that single experiment, I went off to my very first science fair in May. I managed to win first place at the regional level and then at the national level. And the award ceremony at nationals was maybe around 2 p.m. I left Ottawa to fly back to Toronto around 4 p.m. And I got back home at 7 or 8 o'clock. And at 8 o'clock, I found out that in just six hours, news of my story, news of my work had spread. News outlets from all over Canada had picked it up and were spreading my story. And when I checked my email, my uh, tweets, my Facebook messages, there were people from all over Canada, from British Columbia to Newfoundland, sending me messages, people that had the disease, people with, that were friends or families of people with cystic fibrosis. They were messaging me. And by the next day, the whole world, news outlets from every country, Russia, Spain, the United States, they all had spread my story. And I was getting messages from people all across the world. And a single thread united all their messages. They said that beyond the hope, I mean, beyond the science, beyond whether or not the treatment would go forward or not, they wanted to thank me for giving them hope. Hope? Me? Some grade 11 student that was doing a science fair give these people hope? These people that for every single day of their lives have struggled for every single breath. These five or six-year-olds that every single day know that they have to take their enzymes before they eat so that they can even digest their food. These 30 or 40-year-olds that for every single day of their lives have to have to cough out their mucus before they went to sleep. Me? Give them hope? And it was at this point that I realized that even though for a whole year I had been working on cystic fibrosis, even though I knew all the phosphorylation states and the ATP binding sites and the amino acid sequence of the cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator protein, I had never in that whole year met a CF patient. Hearing all these messages, it really showed me another side of the disease. For a year, I had been preoccupied with molecules and supercomputers and simulations and proteins. I had never seen another side of the disease. And these messages, they showed me a side that was invisible from the lab bench, the human side. And so I think for a researcher or a scientist, the greatest fulfillment or the greatest joy is to be able to see people and see their joy when they know that people are working on their disease, when they see their joy on their faces, when they know that someone is still looking out for them somewhere in the world. People are working on trying to find a cure for their disease. And so um, in June, I went off to two more international science fairs, one in Slovakia and one in the United States. And uh, in July and August, I returned back uh, to Dr. Baer's lab to continue working as a full-time summer research student, verifying the results I got over the, the March break and continuing our research. 
And when I look back on that year, I think I was pretty lucky. I was lucky to have met that single one student at that summer program that sparked this whole journey. I was lucky to have found that one professor that was willing to take a chance on a high school student when no other professors were. And I was lucky to have that single experiment that could have easily failed and probably should have failed somehow succeed. And I think I was lucky just to have been me, this one grade 11 student who kind of bumbled this way and Googled a whole lot and just did, did, he, what he, did what he loved and have his world completely changed by the results. So I want to ask you a few questions today. What are you going to do in the next day, in the next week, in the next month, in the next year? How are you going to change your own life, someone else's life, or the world? And I want you to remember that anybody, anybody in this room that you meet today at the reception, that is in your school, or your workplace, or someone you bump into on the street and start a conversation with, has the potential to change your life. And I want you to remember that you, just as easily, have the potential to be that one person to change someone else's. Thank you.